It is a great honor to be with you here today. Um, I really wish I could be there in person. Uh, that's not possible during this time, but we will do our best to make it as personable as possible. Um, I, I want to start off this presentation trying something a little bit different. I want to I want to start by giving you a short video clip that's about a minute long, and it's a video clip of a cartoon that was created in 1962. I will show this to you, and then I will uh, and then I will actually tell you a story about this this uh, cartoon. Uh, but it's about the Jetsons, which I don't believe anybody in Korea has seen, but it was very popular in the United States um, in the 60s and 70s. So let me, let me start with this video and I'll tell you a story about it afterwards. So the people that created this cartoon were actually in communications with the architects that were building the Space Needle in Seattle at the time. Uh, they were getting ready for the 1965 World's Fair in Seattle. And so they had this notion that all the houses in the future were gonna look like, like the Space Needle. And so that's why you see some of the houses up on stilts in that, that video. Now, I was approached by the Arconic Corporation, which is a spinoff of Alcoa Aluminum. Um, and they wanted to talk to me about doing a remake of this intro to the Jetsons. Now this was actually created in 1962, but it was supposed to portray life a hundred years in the future in 2062. And they were asking me the question, if we were to recreate the Jetsons intro today, how would we go about portraying it? And they brought in Hollywood filmmaker, Justin Lin, and they brought four of us in as consultants to try to come up with ideas for how to redo this. Now, the Arconic Corporation wanted to position themselves as, a, as being on the cutting edge of the, fu the future. And so, with a, with a little ingenuity and lots of interesting ideas, I will now show you the, the remake of that video as it was done many years later. So that's the remake of the intro to the Jetsons. And the reason I showed you that is just to make this single point that our understanding of the future is constantly changing. Everything is evolving and shifting. And, um, and we need to, to, to grasp that, that single concept from watching that. Now, I often uh, struggle with this, this topic of what's getting, uh, what's getting traction. Uh, how do I separate all of the 
uh, what I call good intentions. There's lots of technology that's coming out of the woodwork and there's things that are coming across my desk on a daily basis that I look at it and I say, wow, that's gonna change everything. But, uh, but then nothing happens and nothing happens and then still nothing happens. And so somehow I need to separate of the, the technology that is just good intentions from what's getting traction. And uh, that's, that's how I put my finger on the pulse of what the, the future is gonna be about. Now, the most successful product launch in all history was actually the Tesla Model 3. Um, this is a car that in uh, 2016 that virtually nobody knew anything about. And uh, it, all it was is Elon Musk put a couple tweets on Twitter and over the next couple months, a total of 450,000 people put money down to be on a waiting list for a car that they knew virtually nothing about. There was no drawings, there was no spec sheets, there was no images or pictures. And uh, so people were uh, blindly had faith in that he'd be able to pull it off. So uh, since then, they've, they've actually lived up to all of the hype and uh, it's been a very successful car. But the cars that we drive today have actually been in development for the past 120 years. So it's taken that long for cars to get to as good as they are today. For the past 120 years though, cars have been designed around one central function and that's driving. So as we move into the driverless era, people will no longer drive. And so all of this body of knowledge that the car designers have accumulated over the past century is simply going to go out the window. The human relationship to the steering wheel, the human relationship to the dashboard and the gas pedals, all of that goes out the window as they're focusing on all of the other activities that are going to take place in a car other than driving. And so then we have to ask this the simple question, is it the same job? Uh, and we're going to be asking this question a lot in the future because we're going to have lots of jobs that are shifting and changing very quickly. We now have the ability to be far more unique and niche focused and specialized than ever before in history. So I like to ask this question of how are we going to manage our own hyper individuality moving forward. So every future industry will start as a micro industry. So uh, a couple of years ago, I made the prediction that over the, by, by 2040, we're going to have over 100,000 new micro industries that are created that will come out of the woodwork and uh, they're going to change all of our lives. As Chris Anderson, the former managing editor of Wired Magazine, and he's the author of the Long Tail book, he, he made the, the statement that when the tools of production are become available to everybody, everyone becomes a producer. And that's what we're moving into an era where everybody will have access to these tools and they can be the creators that they can become the innovators and, and create new things. To give you an example of this, I like to, to focus on the, the shoe industry. The annual market for shoes in the world right now, every year we sell roughly 21 billion pairs of shoes around the world. That's roughly three pairs of shoes for every person on planet Earth. Now, the predictions are that within the next five years, that 5% will be smart shoes. Now, uh, smart shoes mean different things to different people. And so smart shoes in the future will have different pores on the side that open and close to allow more air coming in. They will have expanding gel packs in the, the bottom of them to, to, so you can maintain an even pressure on the bottom of your foot. They will have lots of sensors, lots of data. And this idea of what a smart shoe is will shift and change as, as we move forward. And we will have mom and pop businesses. This is small one or two person businesses cropping up and in the very near future, we will be able to take our smartphones and to be able to scan our feet and create a digital model of our foot and then be able to send that in. And then they can use that digital model of our foot to then 3D print a perfectly fitting shoe every time. 
Now these perfectly fitting shoes are gonna have lots of different uh, innovations built into them. And some of them will be excessive, some of them will be crazy, like this one here has televisions built into the shoe. But the idea is that these are smart shoes. And so to give you an idea of what this is capable of, if you're a person that likes to go jogging at night, your smart shoes will recognize that it's dark outside and it'll signal for a drone to fly overhead and to guide along with you as you're running down the street so it can light up the path in front of you. And because this is a smart shoe, it can authorize a payment uh, to pay for the rental of that, that drone as it's lighting up the road in front of you. But keep in mind, this doesn't have to be just about jogging people. It can also be about when it's raining, you could have an umbrella drone fly overhead and keep you dry. See, we're a very backward looking society. We're backward looking because it's just human nature. We've all personally experienced the past. As we look around us, we see evidence of the past all around us. In fact, all information we come into contact with is essentially history. So my job as a futurist is to help turn people around to give them some idea of what the future holds, because we can't just be walking backwards into the future. So my job is to turn people around and uh, to give us, give everybody a new perspective on what's, what the future brings. So if you ask this question of how does the future get created, the future gets created in the minds of everybody around us. We all participate in creating the future. Certainly some of us have more influence than others. But people are making decisions today based on their understanding of what the future holds. So I use this phrase quite a bit, the future creates the present. Now, this is just the opposite of what most people think. Most people think that what we're doing today is somehow going to create the future. But from a little different perspective, it's these images of the future that we have in our heads determine our actions today. So here's the key thing. If we change somebody's vision of the future, we change the way they make decisions today. And that's, that's my goal. Um, that's my job is to change people's vision of the future. And as a result, they will walk out of the room making different decisions. As Larry Page likes to say, it's the main reasons companies fail is that they miss the future. I happen to agree with that. So COVID-19 has been a very dark time in human history. And I'm gonna talk through the five long range consequences of COVID. So this will be the most expensive crisis in all human history. This will be more expensive than even World War II or any of the other wars or any natural disasters. Uh, the total money we're spending on COVID is just absolutely staggering. Businesses were simply never designed to be shut down and restarted months later. And it's impossible to have this many top-down decisions without creating a massive number of unintended consequences. So our increasing awareness of the world means that everybody is watching. So we're making these decisions and people are watching, watching us. And globally, the poor are getting poorer and the vulnerable are becoming more vulnerable. We have over 100 million more people have been cast into the ranks of extreme poverty as a result of COVID. And we're not, we're not done with it yet. Um, this could go on and that number could actually double, triple, or quadruple over the next year. Number three, we're experiencing the biggest job transition in all history. As we shut down and put people in quarantine, it's given everybody time to sit back and think. This introspective perspective that we've gained, a lot of people are saying, wow, is this really where I wanted to be at this point in my life? And so it's given us time to think, and more and more people are looking at this and saying, wow, I really would like something with more meaning and purpose. And for that reason, we're seeing so many more resignations happening and people stop and they're, uh, they're, they're, they're looking for other jobs. Now, contact phobia is going to permeate our thinking for generations to come. We've suddenly 
we've gotten some new respect, a healthy respect for the, the touching of people and all the germs in the air and the breathing on other people and people that are sick around us. And so we're wearing masks and we're not touching people. We're using things to clean ourselves. And this phobia is gonna be with us for generations to come. This is creating a deep seated paranoia that will last for, for actually for decades. This idea of shaking hands with somebody is a symbol now for you're an idiot. And number five, COVID has become the greatest source of conspiracy theories in all history. We're entering a period of an era of fake news, fake people and fake reality. So instead of playing video games, we're gonna start playing conspiracy theory games. But even in the darkest of times, people of extraordinary character have lived among us, guiding us on a pathway to a better future. So during great times of great chaos comes great opportunity. So I'm gonna take you through the 10 post COVID opportunities. The first one is that working remote is here to stay. So we're, we've reprioritized our life. And so we've made life first and work second. So the rise of remote is leading to people to reprioritize re what's important to them. They wanna make sure that their, their family is well taken care of now. By focusing on outcomes, employers help people make time count instead of simply counting time. And so workers will do what needs to be done rather than wasting their time trying to look busy. The tools that enable asynchronous work are the most important things globally for remote teams. So they, they enable people to get a lot accomplished without having people synced up with their every move. Now, because we're not commuting, we're actually gaining a whole new respect for health uh, throughout this crisis. And the lack of a commute is actually giving most workers around 25 extra days a year to do other things. That is absolutely huge. And world-class people are now moving to smaller cities, to rural communities that have a lower cost of living and a higher quality of life. And these, these world-class people are actually dramatically changing the, uh, uh, the, the nature of these communities. And so this de-urbanization trend, we don't know how long that's gonna last, but it looks like it's here to stay. Number two, digital twin technology will transform the human experience. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with digital twin technology, as we add more and more sensors to our life, we're starting to put sensors on everything around us. We put sensors on the, the pieces of equipment and whether that's uh, a big tractor or whether that's a cruise ship or whether it's a, a turbine at a power plant, we're now able to monitor this equipment remotely from the other side of the world. And we're able to tell when something is, has gone wrong. And we're also now able to anticipate failures and, and plan for these outages as we prepare for things in the future. Now, the next step of, of, of this digital twin technology is what's called remote robotics. This is where we, it enables us to manage things remotely. So we're not just watching things, we're also able to control things from the other side of the world. And if you're familiar with the Da Vinci robot that's being used for doing surgeries, doctors are performing surgeries from many miles away, from long ways away and uh, working on patients that way. It raises lots of questions like, at what point do we no longer need operators to be in the vehicle and how much longer will pilots still need to be flying in the airplanes and how long before digital twin technology is common with humans and how much longer before doctors can monitor somebody help, somebody's health remotely through their digital twin. This is all coming very quickly. So healthcare is transitioning from an industry driven by pharmaceuticals to an industry driven by data. Will the human genome just become another programming language? So rather than 
prescribe pills for somebody who is ill, will we prescribe an algorithm that they can download and cure what's wrong with them? Maybe. CRISPR technology is taking us a long ways in that direction. In 2012, Jennifer Doudna, the co-inventor of CRISPR-Cas9, first demonstrated the ability to cut and, and repaste segments of DNA. CRISPR is a revolutionary tool to improve humanity. So here's eight examples of how CRISPR is gonna be used in the future. CRISPR can correct genetic errors that cause disease even before a baby is born. It can eliminate the microbes that cause disease, including COVID-19. CRISPR is being used to develop clean meat technology. And I'll talk about this more in just a little bit here. Um, this is a technology that will very likely take us to the next level of humanity. CRISPR will be used to develop healthier foods. Number five, CRISPR may even be used to revive extinct animals like the woolly mammoth. Number six, CRISPR may eliminate the threat of disease spreading mosquitoes. This is being, um, being worked with right now. There's, there's actually some field tests going on, some pilot projects, and we'll see how well that performs. Number seven, CRISPR has the potential to make trans, transplantable organs safer and more readily available. And number eight, CRISPR could help people have healthier babies as well as designer babies. And designer babies are gonna be a hot topic over the coming years. Number four, cryptocurrencies are going to surge during this time. The coming era, the, the coming era we're gonna be uh, seeing lots of cryptocurrency banks, insurance, loans, mortgages, coaches, and advisors. All of this is going to be coming out of the woodwork. Now, there's, there's actually five features in cryptocurrencies that make it so that they are, uh, they are here to stay. Uh, all the cryptocurrencies, they're open, they're borderless, they're decentralized, they're neutral, they're censorship resistant, and national currencies are going to dwindle as a result of this. In fact, by 2030, over 25% of national currencies will be replaced with some form of digital cryptocurrency. Number five, cultured lab-grown meat production facilities will be common in 2025. So cultured exotic meats like uh, wombat meat or penguin meat or bumblebee meat. We're not just going to be growing um, these meats in the laboratory, these industrial meat facilities that, uh, that, are, that compete with beef, pork, chicken, fish. Um, no, they're gonna get more, much more exotic than that. Now, keep in mind that the lab grown, industrial grown meats start with an actual stem cells from animals and they are able to grow many times faster than they can on the animal. There's no pain or suffering caused to the animal and they're able to grow these in vats in eight to 10 weeks and then they harvest the meat. Now, in addition to just growing meats, and this is gonna be common growing up in lots of areas around the world very quickly, uh, we're gonna start seeing experiments with lab grown blood and lab grown breast milk as well. And just uh, a few days ago, Israel's company called Future Meats, uh, their plant made, made all the, the newspapers around the world as they were the very first to start offering cell-based slaughter-free meats. This is what one of those facilities will look like. Uh, and it's pretty, pretty elaborate equipment uh, to, to make this, this, this transition. But these type of facilities are gonna grow up in cities all around the world over the next few years. Number six, we're gonna be making a massive transition to electric vehicles. Um, by 2025, electric vehicles will have, uh, some of them will have up to a thousand mile range and less than a 10 minute recharge time. This is absolutely huge. This is such a game changer. Um, that's 1,500 kilometers uh, to do the conversion. 
Now by 2025, in, internal combustion engines will for the most part have ended all production. Electric vehicles are so much more efficient and so much easier to use and less maintenance costs that this transition will happen very quickly. Number seven, following the electric car transition, we're gonna be moving to autonomous vehicles. Now driverless technology is going to be the most disruptive technology in all history. As I like to say is very soon, cars with steering wheels will seem as outdated as dial telephones. This means that the car loan industry will disappear. Um, uh, it will decline and then disappear altogether over time. The same with the car insurance industry, it will eventually decline and disappear altogether. It will also give rise to driverless mobile businesses. So if you're sitting at home at night and you need something from the store, rather than getting dressed and going to the store, you can summon the store to come to you. You can have the convenience store come out in front of your, where you live and then you can go down and just grab what you need. It will automatically charge you because you have an account set up there. And as you walk out, you pay for everything that you've just taken. Now, we're going to be seeing this take off in lots of different forms. So it's not just uh, retail stores. We will have retail offices. Uh, we'll have offices for people rather than going to a building and doing our work we can actually summon one of these vehicles to come down and then we can drive around the city, pick up people for meetings, dropping them back off again. Um, we can have all kinds of conferences if we want. We can even, if you have a cooking school as an example, you can drive around and pick up students and give them, teach them some cooking techniques along the way and then drop them off at the end of the day. Uh, and whether it's uh, driverless hair, hair shops whether it's dog grooming shops, uh, driverless banks, um, bike rental, bike repair, uh, nails, hair, uh, hair extensions, everything that you want, you'll have uh, available in these driverless mobile setups. We'll have lots of retail stores that, that are equipped with merchandise on the inside or the outside. And if you wanna throw a party, all you have to do is summon um, a robotic bar to come to your wherever you want to hold the party and you can even have a robotic band that are playing at your party. Now the big difference in this type of arrangement is today the merchants that own these local shops are spending tremendous amounts of money driving traffic to get to come to the store. But as we we take on this arrangement of driverless mobile vehicles then the vehicles can go to where the people are. So anytime there's, there's a, a softball tournament, a basketball tournament, or anytime there's a parade on Main Street, these, these driverless mobile vehicles can then set up shop. Now, if you want to hold a convention in a remote location, sometime in the future, you will be able to summon driverless mobile hotel rooms to come and set up at that site. And then as soon as your conference is over, all of these driverless mobile hotel rooms will, will leave and go to the next location. These can also be driverless mobile hospital beds. So anytime there's a natural disaster, a hurricane, a tsunami, uh, any type of disaster like that, uh, these things can come and will set up shop and have hospital beds right close to where the problem area is. Now, driverless mobile doctor offices are already being developed. Rather than you driving to the, see the doctor, this mobile unit can come to you and do all kinds of diagnostics work. And these are already being developed and are already performing quite well. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the mall of the future, in my mind, will be a large uh, warehouse space. And every morning they open the doors for driverless mobile businesses to pull in and set up shop. It'll be a, a different configuration of businesses every day of the week. That'll make it much more interesting for people attending because it'll be a new experience every day. Number eight, air taxis will soon be creating a hyper-individualized air transportation market. 
So air taxis are becoming increasingly common um, and they will become super common between 2025 and 2030. Now, a lot of it has to do with the pricing, if they get the pricing right, so it's not too much more expensive than, than uh, driving across town, this is, becomes a no-brainer. Uh, but very soon, lots of major cities are going to have over 50,000 drones flying overhead on a daily basis. These are passenger drones combined with delivery drones and, and surveillance drones and every other thing you can imagine. So cities and counties will employ fleets of scanning drones to scan the cities. And uh, they'll begin to build digital models of the city and keep track of things as they're scanning over and over. They're checking for all the things that are changing along the way. And these digital models will get uh, higher and higher resolution as they go. But this will give rise to search engines for the physical world. Very soon, we're going to be using super sensors to search on everything from, I want something that smells like this, or I want something that tastes like this, or this bar barometric pressure, or this harmonic vibration, or this level of reflectivity or texture. All of these things will become available and we don't have to know how the search engine is doing it. We just have to know that it's giving us the right results. So search engines for the physical world in the not too distant future, we'll be able to search on things like, where is that dog with rabies right now? Or what's the heaviest traffic intersection in the city? If there is a stalker incident, where did that, how close did John Doe get to Jane Doe yesterday? We can do infrastructure reports on what are the most dangerous bridges in the city or county today. Drone delivery coupled with air taxis will drive demand for many airports. I wanna show you this, this quick video clip here of how Airbus thinks about uh, drone taxis in the future. So all of these flying drones are going to give rise to many airports. And now we don't know exactly what all these are going to look like, but as the amount of traffic grows for these many airports, it'll go from just one landing pad to two to four to six to eight. And some of them will be on the tops of buildings. Some of these many airports will be on the ground, but we're going to uh, learn how to work with these and unique in different ways. We'll have to have some sort of a terminal space for people to uh, come and go from. And so as the amount of traffic picks up, we're going to have to create much more elaborate systems for dealing with this type of, of vehicle. Number nine, satellite internet will dramatically transform communications. So Star Starlink um, is really setting the, the pace for um, satellite internet right now. And they, they started off with analyzing the situation that 40% of the world still doesn't have stable internet. That works out to roughly 4 billion potential new users, mostly non-English speaking, mostly poor. But entrepreneurs everywhere will have unfettered access to the global internet, irrespective of the government's telco monopolies. So this does have monopoly breaking capabilities but um, somehow there needs to be some level of cooperation that goes along with it. So Starlink is on, on pace to send up 30,000 satellites into space. Right now they're right at somewhere around 1,500, uh, close to that, um, but they've got a lot of competition coming. Uh, Amazon's Kuiper network will have 3,200. 
one web will have 2,000. Iridium already has 66 up. Samsung will have 4,600. China is planning on putting up 10,000. And so there's, there's going to be a lots of activities in this space uh, with, with small lunchbox sized satellites traveling around the earth. So this is a, a, a profound thought here that competing in a networked world the key to competitive advantage is no longer the sum of all efficiencies, but the sum of all connections. So the last, last one I'll talk about is the rapidly shifting demographics. Um, and this is, again, one thing that's happening quite quickly. In 2019, Elon Musk made the statement, he says, I think the biggest problem the world will face 20 years from now is population collapse. And he emphasized the word collapse. So today's demographics is shifting quickly. Um, most of the countries in blue on this, on this map are have a declining population and only the ones in red have, actually have a growing population. So, uh, this is kind of a staggering thing to learn, but over half of the world's population is actually being born in just six countries. And these six countries include Nigeria, Congo, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Angola, and Pakistan. Now I put the literacy rate next to the name of the countries here. These are countries that get largely ignored by the rest of the world and yet uh, as we move forward, over half of the world's population is coming from these six countries, and they all have access to smartphones. So if you think we have a bad refugee problem today, these are young people that are looking at their smartphones every day and they're saying, wow, there's great things happening in the world and it isn't happening here, so I think I will go there. And they will have very little risk traveling around the world because they've learned to live with with not much uh, as they travel. So by 2050, the most popular at the current uh, uh, population growth rates, the biggest country in the world will be India with 1.45 billion people, followed by China, followed by Nigeria, followed by the US and Pakistan and Congo. So this is changing quickly. In fact, at the current growth rates, at the current birth rates, 23 countries will lose over half their population by 2100. Now this naturally can change, but uh, sometimes it takes a long time to turn things around like this. So the lowest birth rate in the world is actually Korea, followed by Japan, China, Brazil, Thailand, Italy, Russia, Ukraine, Poland, Spain, all of these countries are gonna lose over half the population by 2100. So the key takeaway is that the same technology that is automating jobs out of existence is the same technology that will be creating new businesses and industries. And that's where education comes into play. So the role of education is changing. It's no longer possible to predict the educational needs of business four to five years in advance. We are currently preparing students for jobs that don't exist using technology that hasn't been invented to solve problems we don't even know are problems yet. So the average person entering the workforce in 2030 will need to reboot their career somewhere between eight to 10 times throughout their working life. Now, as artificial intelligence enters our lives, we're standing on the brink of this massive technological revolution. And AI has been brewing for many decades in, in research labs and studies and, and all the, the work that's being done in the background. And it's actually coming together a large convergence right now. Now, AI's early adopters are everything from healthcare to energy tech to driverless vehicles um, Internet of Things, 3D printers, drone technology. And we're seeing headlines right now that self-taught AI beats doctors at predicting heart attacks. AI is learning what makes people cry in the movies. It's also making them, uh, it's learning what makes people buy in a retail setting. 
Um, AI is able to convert an image of food into a list of ingredients. Uh, the country of Estonia plans to use AI powered robot judges to replace human judges. And AI can predict when someone will die with unsettling accuracy. So all of this is happening in a world where the world's base of knowledge is doubling every 12 hours. Now keep in mind in 1900, the world base of knowledge was doubling every century. Now it's doubling every 12 hours. So yesterday at this very time, we had one fourth as much knowledge as we have today that's available. This growing base of everything from podcasts to videos to blogs to articles that people are writing to books, all of this growing base of knowledge is just growing exponentially. And I love to ask this question of how many Einsteins and Mozarts are born in every million people. And the key questions are, can there be more and should there be more? The human race has an unwritten mandate to pass knowledge from one generation to the next. And yet libraries aren't quite good enough. Colleges just aren't fast enough and technology still has a poor interface for the human mind. But changes are happening very quickly, and that's where some of this new technology is coming into play. Our education systems have been built around just-in-case learning, which ends up being a very poor fit for our just-in-case business world, our just-in-time business world. So our, most of our learning takes place surrounding you need to learn all this information just in case you might use it sometime in the future. When most of the situations we run into, we have to learn things on the spot. Very little of what we learn in college ever gets put into practical use in the business world today. So we're running into this competition. Colleges are going to be faced with this uh, growing competition from, from certifications. Uh, certifications are now competing directly with college degrees. We're seeing huge demands for cloud management certification, huge demands for cybersecurity certifications. And very soon we're gonna have a huge demand for quantum computing certifications. Now these certifications are coming out of the woodwork. You can get them in all kinds of healthcare um, uh, types of jobs that you're, that you're gonna wanna perform. You can do it in food service and uh, dental care, health care, uh, everything you can imagine. Now, I've, I've been thinking about this, this topic of accomplishment-based education quite a bit. So unlike apprenticeships, where you, you, you work with a person who is a professional at some, at some task, uh, but virtually none of the effort that's going into achieving college degrees um, is, is doing the, the things that we can accomplish with accomplishment-based education. There are many types of achievement equivalent to college degrees. Uh, as an example, uh, if we had an AI teacher bot that was coaching us, and, and I, I always like to think of this as this interactive conversation, we're talking back and forth to this, this device, and it becomes our best buddy over time. It will then be able to coach us on how to write a book. It will then teach us how to create the characters, how to create the story arc, how to, how to frame out different scenes and how to make a book. And so something that you walk away with as having a real accomplishment uh, when you're done. Uh, the same can happen with somebody who's designing a video game or somebody who wants to invent a new product you can have this AI teacher bot coaching you on all of the different doing prototypes of getting uh, of intellectual property of getting patents and in protection and raising money. All of those things come into play and you can have this device coaching you along the way. Uh, other other types of accomplishment based education are things like producing a documentary or launching a new business. <clears throat> or if you want to found a movement, some type of movement to change society. 
you can you can produce a podcast series and it can help you do that as well or you can just become an expert on whatever topic you want to become an expert in having this ai teacher bot or a coach bot that's actually working with you talking back and forth to you this is something that's new and different i also have worked around with this idea of creating micro credits um, and micro credits are a way of gamifying um, education. So you should be able to get micro credits for lots of learning activities that take place. So as an example, if, if 100 micro credits equal one college credit, then somebody that reads a book and takes a, a quick assessment can get 14.7 micro credits. Somebody watches a movie and takes a quick test, they get 3.2 micro credits or they listen to a podcast or take an online course or listen to a TED talk or watch a documentary or a training video. All of these are activities that happen uh, throughout our, our, our lives. And if there's a way of actually getting micro credits for it, it's a way of actually blockchaining education. We can actually start saving all of these credits in a way that we can use later on because over time, we will be creating something akin to an open source university that accepts learning experiences from everywhere. And we're going to be able to transition this into global credentialing. Now, this is opens the door for this thinking on rewriting the rules of achievement. So right now, the highest level of achievement you can achieve in colleges is a PhD, but by, by actually, Cognifying education, we will be able to actually uh, have levels of achievement far above a PhD. There might be 200 levels above PhD as we learn throughout our entire lifetime. This opens the door for far more opportunities than we could imagine. So if we apply AI to teacher bots, the new game will be to find the fastest way to teach students. Over time, AI will learn every student's proclivity, their idiosyncrasies, their preferred tools, peripheral reference points, and how to stay engaged in learning even in the face of distractions. AI will quickly learn when skills are deficient, what's needed to bring us up to speed, how and when to schedule the training and when we've mastered the new topic. So it'll know when things are working, when things are not working, and when we've mastered a new skill. So throughout this training curve, individual learning will begin to scale far faster than anything we've ever dreamed possible. Two times faster, four times faster, maybe even 10 times faster than anything today. That's why I've been saying that by 2030, the largest company on the internet will be an education-based company that hasn't been invented yet. Now the key, one of the key takeaways here is as long as we have problems, we will always have jobs and there is no shortage of problems. So as Albert Einstein says, education is a progressive realization of our own ignorance. Now keep in mind that colleges will still be performing, but they will have a new competitor in the fold and they will either learn to adapt to this new technology or they can fight it. Either, either way, this new technology is gonna catch on in a big way because it moves society so much farther along and so much faster. So society is changing faster today than ever before in history. Pay close attention, our definitions of heroes, success and achievement are changing. So are our thoughts on villains, virtue, passion, and our quest for accomplishment. We're desperately seeking new forms of leadership, decision-making, ways of settling priorities, and getting things done. And we're looking for our next generation of storytellers to help guide our thinking. So this is a golden opportunity for, for people in the movie industry to actually redefine um, what, our, what our priorities are gonna be moving forward. So we're entering a period of unprecedented opportunity. So why is this period so important? It's because humanity will change more in the next 20 years than in all human history. At the same time, our risk factors are going to increase exponentially. 
we, we are becoming much more vulnerable at the same time. So more and more things become breakable, more and more things can go wrong. In our children's children who haven't even been born yet, they're counting on you. They're counting on the people listening to this to make great decisions. But as Steve Jobs said, this right now is one of those moments when you are influencing the future. But sometimes our best efforts just look a lot like this. Yeah, pretty much just like that. So any of you that are interested in my, my new uh, book, Epiphany Z, it's also available as an audio book. Or if you're interested in the podcast we do called the Futurati Podcast, uh, that's available as well. Or any of you that would just like to sign up for our free newsletter, feel free to do that. And I thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your outstanding speech. Thank you. 감사합니다. 다양한 말씀들을 함께 해 주셨는데요. 그리고 온라인을 통해서 그리고 줌 회의 시스템을 통해서 함께 하고 계시는 참석자 여러분들께서 질문을 남겨 주셨습니다. 프레 박사님 저희 어, 질문 들어온 것들이 몇 가지 있는데 답변을 okay. 부탁드리겠습니다. 아, 그럼 먼저 그줌 화상 회의를 통해서 함께 하고 계신 분들의 질문을 제가 외람되지만 대신 좀 드리겠습니다. 권현경님 함께 하고 계시죠? 혹시 손을 좀 들어 주실 수 있으실까요? 권현경님, 네 미리 저희가 질문을 좀 받아놨는데, 예 질문을 좀 부탁드릴까요? 아, 네 안녕하세요. 그 코로나 19로 급변하고 있는데 혹시 그 대학 교육을 어떻게 혁신적인 방법으로 극복할 수 있는지 궁금합니다. 코로나 19로 급변하고 있는 yeah, 대학 교육. Um, yeah. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, COVID is changing the rules for lots of things. And um, this idea of getting a lot of people into a classroom uh, to learn something new is 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 probably um, going to be more rare than than common moving forward. We're developing new and interesting ways uh, to teach people and I see the role of universities changing as it's oriented more around the experience of education rather than um, the education itself. Um, we're going to be working with lots of devices to help improve the speed of education but the, um, uh, the experience of getting to know people of being able to network with key individuals um, being kind of right on the cutting edge of things that are happening and changing, uh, doing uh, ingenious new research. All of these opportunities, I think, are going to become available um, in, a, in a much different way uh, moving forward. So I think uh, this is, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to see lots of experimentation happening on the college level as we, uh, we work with different opportunities that come our way. Thank you very much for your response. 네, 고맙습니다. 어, 대학 교육의 역할 중에 경험이 굉장히 중요하다. 그리고 앞으로 많은 실험적인 일들이 있을 것이다. 라는 답변을 함께 해주셨습니다. 고맙습니다. 두 번째 질문은 노지인 님께서 함께 하고 계시는 노지인 님께서 주셨는데요. 안녕하세요. 네, 안녕하세요. 네, 소개 좀 잠시 부탁드리고 질문 네. 주실까요? 아, 예, 안녕하세요. 저는 모건대학교 대학교 혁신단의 노지인이라고 합니다. 네, 일단 다빈치 연구소장님의 연구소장 토마스 프레인님의 그 강연 잘 들었습니다. 제 질문은 지금 세계적인 인구 감소로 인해서 입학 자원이 부족한 것으로 알고 있습니다. 한국의 대학이 참고할 만한 세계 대학의 사례는 어떤 것이 있는지 궁금합니다. 음, um, yeah, great question. <laughs> um, now, we don't know how, how long this is. Um, COVID is a bit of an anomaly, so it changes the rules. Um, is it going to permanently change the rules for the next uh, 100 years? Um, it will change some of those rules, but not all of them. Um, so how do we, how do we create an, uh, a learning environment that will be conducive uh, for, and for people who want to learn and uh, do it in unique and different ways. And so 
I think we should constantly be studying the, what's what's happening in Switzerland, what's happening in in, in Finland, and um, many other places around. There's little pockets that are uh, unusual things are taking place all around the world, and uh, and I think we should we have this growing awareness. That's one of the things that the internet is allowing us to do is we're much more aware of things happening around the world than ever before. So if somebody tries a new experiment in one country or another country, um, we can hear about the results uh, very quickly. Um, I think that this is, this is a unique opportunity and we need to be uh, uh, clued into all of this. Um, now, I believe that the technology is going to supercharge our ability to learn things. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I think that this will, will come to the forefront over the next few years. I'm actually working with, um, with a Korean company that's working on uh, AI education, uh, and they are they're producing some pretty remarkable things right at the moment. So I feel pretty confident that this is going to unfold in some um, ways that the rest of the world is going to take notice. Uh, so I'm pretty sure I didn't answer your question, but if you have follow on question, I'll be glad to tackle that. No, I think it's perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much for your response. <laughs> 새로운 기술을 이용해서 빠른 학습이 가능하도록 하는 교육 현장의 이야기를 함께 해주셨는데 눈여겨 보셔야 될것 같고 스위스나 핀란드 혁신적인 방법을 진행하고 있는 사례들 국가들을 좀 살펴봐 달라라는 말씀을 함께 해주셨습니다. 아마 노지님께 답변이 되지 않았을까라는 생각이 들고요. 어, 세 번째 질문도 들어와 있는데 김민정님께서 주셨습니다. 김민정님 안녕하세요. 계시죠? 아마 화상 회의를 통해서 참석하고 계시는데요. 네, 저희가 소리가 들리지 않아서 그 오디오 시스템 한번 확인 부탁드리겠습니다. 네, 김민정님. 어, 오늘 또 질문을 함께 주셨는데요. 말씀 한번 해 보실까요? 아, 네, 안녕하세요. 아, 반갑습니다. 네, 소개 좀 부탁드리고 질문 부탁드리겠습니다. 아, 네. 저는 국립방송연주대학교 기획평가과에 소속되어 있는 김민정이라고 합니다. 네. 질문 주실까요, 박사님께? 아, 네. 어, 강연 잘 들었는데요. 새로운 지식이 많이 유망받고 있는 것 같은데 어, 기존에 있던 지식들과 융합할 수 있는 현실적인 사례가 있는지 궁금합니다. 아, 네. 아, 네. Some of the some of the skills that we're going to need moving forward into the future is um, we're going to need people to understand that they are their own business unit, and so that we need to teach people um, skills surrounding the business of you, uh, teaching people how to become freelancers, to do contract labor, how to actually. Um, market themselves and their skills um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, because we're going to have more and more opportunities moving forward. Um, I, I see that I, it, it occurs to me that the, the world moving ahead, we're going to have um, uh, an era of super employment, but this era of super employment will not be full-time jobs. A lot of it will be part-time jobs and, and uh, freelancer jobs. And so teaching freelancer skills is one of the skills that's going to be uh, critical to learn in the future. So learning how to uh, price your services, how to market your services, how to write a contract, how to negotiate a deal, how to, how to do networking, how to how to set up your books and how to hire people to work for you, how to hire other freelancers to work for you, and how to manage your time. And all of these things are critical components of somebody that will be functional in the, the, the world to come. Um, we, we need to teach people how to be resilient, resourceful, flexible, and determined. These are skills that are are very difficult to to uh, to teach actually, and so we're gonna we're gonna need to learn things that we're 
we're, we're not good at learning uh, in the traditional sense. Um, we're we're going to need to learn how to be able to pivot, how to uh, collaborate, how to um, how to do our our own personal research, and how to uncover information that that in the past we've we've never had to do things like that before, and um, and so these are these are some of the things that are going to be surrounding this new era that we're moving into. Um, so the, the young people today, those people will be our future doctors, our lawyers, our teachers, our nurses, and our future bankers. They're, and we need to understand the, the world they will, they will inherit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we need to understand the world that they're going to inherit so that we'll know what, what skills they need to have uh, moving forward, and so once we we look at um, if you're if you're going to be a car designer, as an example, I talked about being a car designer is far different than what it's been in the past because we're looking at all the other activities happening in the car other than driving. Um, that's the same kind of change that's going to happen in so many different jobs, and we're ha going to have to learn to. Um, uh, to, to work with these different skills and to be able to teach them. Now, there's no one size fits all formula for how to teach somebody how to do something. If you're, if you're gonna become a bricklayer, you still have to actually lay bricks. Um, and, and so there's some things that just cannot be taught digitally, some things cannot be taught physically. And so there, we have to uh, adapt to whatever the situation demands. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I avoided your question there, but. Uh, <laughs> is, is, okay. So you, you can go on, you can continue. Yeah. 아마 답변을 하신 것 같은데 기존의 사회와 또 변화되는 미래의 사회에 있어서 우리가 어떤 부분들을 좀 확인하고 다르게 대처해야 할지 말씀을 주셨는데요. 어, 새로운 지식이 융합 어, 받고 있는데 기존의 지식과 융합할 수 있는 현실적인 사례에 대한 질문도 다시 들어와 있어서 제가 한번더 드리겠습니다. 박사님 그좀 전에 기술을 이용해서 빠른 학습이 가능하도록 하는 교육도 진행하고 있다. 그래서 한국의 AR 회사와 함께 어, 진행을 하고 있다라는 말씀을 해주셨는데 이런 것처럼 AR이라든가 VR, AI 등 어, 지금 새로운 지식들이 유망받고 있는 새로운 지식들이 많은데 기존의 지식하고 융합할 수 있는 교육의 현실적인 사례들이 있으면 소개를 해주시면 도움이 되실 것 같습니다. 음. Yeah, um, I, I like to use this example of uh, what is the television watching experience going to be 20 years from now? Are we still going to be looking at an appliance in the front of the room? Will it be a digital wallpaper? Will it be three-dimensional? Will it be a projected image? Will we be able to interact with these, um, with some sort of holographic image? Will we be able to touch uh, a dress that somebody's wearing and, and buy that dress online uh, or a purse or a belt or something like that. Will, um, will we be able to actually have um, this interaction take place uh, on a level where we can actually touch and feel? Will we have haptic sensations that go along with it? Um, all of this uh, opens the door for entirely new experience. I've often thought that the, the movie, um, the movie watching experience in the future would be in the round. And so um, we would have people sitting all the way around the center of it and we would have very tall uh, holographic images that of people actually running across the stage. And every person that is watching it is seeing it from a different angle. And so they will come to these movies multiple times to, to get a different perspective on them. So that, um, that opens the door for a far different type of experience than anything that we, we could imagine right at the moment. So having access to these type of tools, I think is critical. Um, 
one one tool that's being um, worked on at the moment is a, a rapid assessment tool that uh, rather than sitting down and taking a three hour test um, in something like five to 10 minutes, it can give a rapid assessment of that person's skills and abilities without having to go through that grueling experience. We're gonna start seeing much more of that moving forward in the future. Thank you, thank you very much. We can look forward to even more great things ahead, uh, listening your speech, uh, your precious opinion from you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'd like to move uh, to the next question from the online participants. Uh, 오늘 또 오종석 님께서 예, 질문을 미리 주셨는데요. 함께 하고 계시죠? 안녕하세요. 안녕하십니까? 네, 소개 좀 부탁드리고 네. 질문 부탁드릴까요? 네. 네, 경상국립대학교 오종석입니다. 네. 박사님이 이끌고 있는 다빈치 연구소에서는 마이크로 칼리지라는 3개월 학위 과정을 운영하고 있는 걸로 알고 있는데요. 한국 대학이 이를 벤치마킹하려 한다면 어떤 조언을 해 주시겠습니까? 음. Um, the, uh, actually we we're, we're no longer running the Da Vinci Coders program. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some background on that. We, uh, we were the second uh, uh, micro college to start up back in 2012 in the United States. We were um, following um, one that was started in Chicago. And there were, at the time, uh, we were the only two that were, were actually teaching programming classes. Um, the theory behind Da Vinci Coders was is that of that we wanted to just teach the coding skills, um, not all the theory that goes behind computer, um, a computer science degree. And so we, we came to the conclusion after talking to many of the experts that if somebody had roughly a thousand hours of experience in coding, that that would give them enough uh, to get an entry level position in, uh, in a, a programming area of a company. And that seemed to work out quite well. Um, but as we started up our coding school, then many more coding schools cropped up around the country. And um, by uh, 2017, then we had over uh, 750 coding schools around the country. And we were, we were actually training too many. We didn't have the, um, the right metrics for actually assessing the needs of of industry. So we were teaching Ruby on Rails and then there was too many Rails programmers that were out there. And then we started transitioning to JavaScript and to Python and game design. And, um, and then at, in the end, there was too many schools out there. And so uh, we decided to close that down as we had felt pretty good about launching this whole new era. But I think that um, I think that there's a golden opportunity there for micro colleges to crop up and to teach key skills and offer certifications. Now this can be done uh, inside of an existing college or it can be done as a separate business operation. But um, I think there's, there's huge lessons that can be learned along the way. And uh, anybody that has a thousand hours of training on a specific topic, uh, actually has quite a bit of learning that goes into the background. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure if that's helpful for you or not, but uh, that's what we learned along the way. <laughs> 고맙습니다. 아마 한국 대학이 예, 혁신을 일궈 가는데 박사님의 말씀이 큰 도움이 되지 않을까라는 생각이 듭니다. 어, 저희 잠깐 또 홈페이지를 통해서 질문이 들어와 있어서 또한 가지 드리겠습니다, 박사님. 그 요즘 메타버스가 굉장히 한국에서 뭐전 세계적으로 유행이라고 말씀드릴 수 있겠는데요. 정말 많은 분들께서 사용하고 있는데 미래학자 입장에서 메타버스가 교육에 미칠 영향 어떻게 보시는지 궁금합니다. Um. Let me let me ask you what you mean by metaverse. I'm not sure if I'm 
uh, understand that term the same way that you do? Uh, this 3D를, 3D를 이용해서 가상 현실에 직접 제, 내가 아바타를 이용해서 함께 체험을 할수 있는 그런 공간이라고 저희는 이해를 하고 있거든요. 아, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was just a, a couple of weeks ago that that we interviewed Philip Rosedale on our podcast, the Futurati podcast. Philip Rosedale was the founder of Second Life, and um, and that that was kind of the forerunner to many of these virtual experiences. So uh, uh, the. Part of the problem that they had with Second Life is is they there wasn't enough bandwidth uh, for many of the places in the world that wanted to work with it, and so Second Life actually built up to an audience of around a million people every day, spending about four and a half <coughs> around four and a half hours uh, actually in in the the metaverse, and so the um, um, and that, that number has actually stayed the same ever since they got up to about a million. So you don't hear much about Second Life anymore, but that's, it's still going on in the background. Now there's, um, there's advantages and disadvantages to working with the, the metaverse because it can become so attractive that people become addicted to it that they, they lose perspective on the rest of their life. And um, they, they uh, get out of touch with the rest of the world. Uh, at this, in the same token, there's business opportunities inside the metaverse. Um, you can sell things, you can do things, you can meet people, you can, it, it's a whole different type of community. And just as we're learning with, with uh, uh, social media that, um, that we, can, we can actually take things to extremes and we can waste all of our time um, being sociable and not actually accomplish anything in our lives. And so it takes us away from things that are perhaps more important or, or things that will actually pay the bills and actually um, give us a salary and make the rent. The, um, the, the metaverse has, has pluses and minuses. And we're going to be, as we develop more and more bandwidth to work with, we're going to be able to create the metaverse in much higher, richer detail than ever before. We're still quite a ways away from optimizing things the way we need to at the moment. Um, that will be coming. And one of the, the big things that we're going to be developing along the way is, is a conversational interface, being able to talk back and forth to, uh, uh, to something and whether it's a driverless car or whether it's the metaverse or whether it's uh, some other devices or tools that we have, we're going to be able to ask for things rather than have to figure out drop down menus and have to figure out the interface on some elaborate uh, program that we've just purchased. We, we can actually just talk our way through things and that changes um, changes things dramatically. It changes our need for reading and writing. It changes our need for, um, for, for actually having somebody train us on how to use some program because um, a, a real conversational interface will allow us to, to navigate our way through things in unique and different ways. So um, those, are, those are just some of the things that come to mind here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your response. 아, 아마 이제 그 시간상 마지막 질문이 될것 같습니다. 역시 홈페이지에 올라와 있는데요. 어, AI가 도제식으로 학생을 교육시키기 이전에 현재의 대학 교육과 이런 AI식 도제 교육 사이에 아마 몇년 시간이 걸릴 것 같습니다. 그 사이에 도제식으로 사람이 교육할 수 있지 않을까요? 라는 질문을 주셨는데 아마 강연 중에 말씀 중에 예, 질문을 주신 것 같습니다. 답변 부탁드립니다. Yeah, now there's, there's actually um, different um, virtual tools that are out there and we've been, um, been speculating on some of these tools. Um, 
that like the Microsoft HoloLens as an example um, had the potential for when you're wearing these, these glasses to allow somebody to see what you're seeing and hear what you're hearing and then be able to advise you on what to do next. So if you're um, working on repairing a car or whether you, you're trying to pick out uh, your next stock that you want to buy or lots of uh, things that you need to make a decision on, having a smarter person looking over your shoulder, being able to advise you on how to do that, um, really makes sense. And that seemed like it held so much promise. Now the problem with um, uh, HoloLens though is that the, the screen size was way too tiny, the resolution was poor, and so it just didn't live up to the hype um, that they created around that product. Now that's the type of thing that might be an interim step though towards having some of these AI interfaces and um, and, and so we, we need to keep our eye open, our eyes open for that type of technology. Um, it has huge potential. Now having humans uh, coaching people, if there's a way for one, one person to coach five or 10 people at a time, that, that enables us to leverage our talent in far better ways than we have in the past. Um, as, uh, uh, um, there's Benjamin Bloom is a gentleman in the 1980s that did a lot of research and, and uh, on, on learning. And he found that if you took person out of the, uh, the traditional classroom and you put them with a one-on-one -on -one tutor that you would take them from the 70th percentile up to the 99th percentile. Um, it's a dramatic shift in their performance just by giving them one-to-one -one training. And I always, I always think of that as kind of the optimal, um, uh, if I have that choice to make, if I could actually select one-on-one -on -one training, uh, I'm, I'm gonna get far better educated that way. And, and, but nothing about the one-on-one -on -one training actually scales very well, unless we, we figure out the technology for doing that. I, I hope that, that answers some of your questions. I, uh, I, I certainly wish you the best moving forward. Uh, this has been a great opportunity to work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. And also wrapping up, I cordially ask you uh, to share with us your feeling participating in this forum. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We really, really thank you for your sincere response. Uh, even it's quite long time, and um, uh, despite the time differences, I believe that you are middle of night. Thank you very much. Right. 네, 온라인 right. 참석자 여러분들 큰 박수 부탁드리겠습니다. 진심으로 감사드립니다.